A town hall should, in my opinion, be the most dominant and important of the municipal buildings of the city in which it is placed. It should be the means of giving due expression to public feeling upon all national and municipal events of importance. It should serve, as it were, as the exponent of the life and soul of the city. So Sir Charles Barry, the great Victorian architect of Westminster Palace and, of course, Halifax Town Hall, on the municipal palaces of England and their meaning for urban life. And that is my topic for this evening as we gather to celebrate the 600th anniversary of the founding of London's Guildhall. Begun in 1411, the Guildhall was a confident, even cocky, celebration of the power and authority of late medieval London's merchant class. London, in the 15th century, along with Norwich, York and Exeter, was an urban powerhouse, not just of England, but also Europe. But this evening, uh, as befits my position as Member of Parliament for Stoke-on-Trent Central, I wish to follow Sir Charles North to describe the great town halls of Victorian Britain and what the history of these great buildings can tell us about the story of the 19th century and its legacy today. But how did it all begin? Another great Victorian, George Eliot, described it thus. Long before the thunder of Stevenson's rocket, before the steam-powered factory in the northern mill town, a passenger seated on the box of a horse-drawn mail coach might witness the rhythms of another country. Suppose only that his travels took him through England's central plain, watered at one extremity by the Avon and at the other by the Trent. The journey would glide through long lines of bushy willows marking the watercourses, the golden corn ricks clustered near the roofs of some midland homestead. But as the day wore on, the scene would darken, the traveller passing from one era of English life to another. The land would begin to be blackened with coal pits, the rattle of hand looms to be heard in hamlets and villages. Here were powerful men walking queerly, with knees bent outward from squatting in the mine, going home to throw themselves down in their blackened flannel and sleep through the daylight. Here, the pale, eager faces of handloom weavers, men and women, haggard from sitting up late at night to finish the week's work. And there, on the horizon, glowed the breath of the manufacturing town, which made a cloudy day and a red gloom by night, filling the air with eager unrest. The busy scene of the shuttle and the wheel, of the roaring furnace, of the shaft and the pulley, seemed to make but crowded nests in the midst of the large space slow-moving life of homesteads and faraway cottages. Here was a world made anew by the Industrial Revolution. When George Eliot recounted this transition from country to city, agriculture to industry, the revolution she described had long since calcified. Eliot composed her historical novel, Felix Holt the Radical, after the 1851 census had christened England the first industrialized urban nation with over 50% 50 of its population resident in towns or city. The bald statistic merely confirmed what had been apparent for decades, the progressive change of rural life, of traditions of husbandry and village custom. Within Queen Victoria's reign, Blake's green and pleasant land became a nation of cities and the British and urban people. Industrialization and urbanization went hand in hand to shatter practices centuries old and to crown Britain the workshop of the world decades before her commercial and military rivals in continental Europe or North America. Britain was the first. The horrors, the wonders, the isolation, the inequality, the opportunity of industrialization and urbanization all appeared in their modern guise for the first time in late 18th, early 19th century Britain. Pulled out by agricultural, pushed out by agricultural poverty and pulled in by the lure of a steady wage. During the first half of the 19th century, city populations expanded ferociously as the cotton mills whirled, the ports bustled, and the factory chimneys vomited forth their filthy smog. Between 1800 
and 1841, the city of Sheffield more than doubled its population from 45,000 to over 110,000 on the back of the manufacture of cutlery and then iron and steel production. During the same period, Bradford's successful woolen and worsted industries saw it grow by a rate of 10% a year. Meanwhile, Liverpool grew from 80,000 to over 280,000, and Manchester, including Salford, from 95,000 to over 300,000. And unsurprisingly, the cities were wholly unable to cope with this massive influx of migrants, and the result was a terrifying breakdown in sanitary infrastructure and public health. Amidst the squalor, the stench, the open latrines lurked death. Typhoid, typhus, smallpox, cholera, scarlet fever, measles, whooping cough, diphtheria, diarrhoea thrived in the early Victorian city. Contaminated water was the source of the most feared killer of them all, cholera. An outbreak in 1832 killed 32,000 people across the country. In 1848, it returned to kill another 62,000. The result of these sanitary and housing conditions was a total collapse in the life chances of the inhabitants of the early Victorian city. In cities of over 100,000, life expectancy at birth dropped from 35 years in the 1820s to 29 years in the 1830s. In 1841, Liverpool, life expectancy at birth was only 28.1 years, the lowest since the Black Death. But the Industrial Revolution was about much more than collapsing life expectancy, pollution, or ill health. It was also about change and transformation, modernity and progress. In my own view, Derby, the Derwent Valley, the non-conformist circles of the East Midlands can arguably lay claim to the intellectual origins of the Industrial Revolution. But its full effects, its terrifying enormity, were first felt in the Northwest. It is in Ancoats, Oldham, Burnley, Stoke-on-Trent that the seismic changes unleashed by industry was realized. The mechanization, the technology, the exploitation of raw materials and energy sources, the class divides, the social immiseration, the employment of women and children, the riches, the culture, the solidarity. Hast thou heard with sound ears, asked the Victorian sage Thomas Carlyle, the awakening of a Manchester on a Monday morning at half past five by the clock, the rushing off of its thousand mills like the boom of an Atlantic tide, 10,000 times 10,000 spools and spindles all set humming there. It is perhaps, if thou knew it well, sublime as a Niagara or more so. Despite all this, despite the filth, the sanitary dangers, the very amorality of the city. There were defenders of 19th century urban life. And as cities began little by little to overcome the immediate problems thrown up by industrialization, the numbers willing to defend the city grew in confidence. Chief amongst them were the new civic elites of Victorian Britain. Running businesses, export industries, the professions, proudly middle class and often non-conformist in religion. And this is one of the great cultural spurs in the development of the Victorian city and its embodiment in the town halls. The conjunction of a more codified and conscious middle class identity with urban life, that the middle classes would realize and express themselves through the art, architecture, and fabric of Victorian civic life. This new class in society, which was turning itself from the rather inchoate, middling sort into a far more self-conscious middle class, proudly aligned their history and purpose with the new industrial city. They first of all celebrated the city as the harbinger of liberty. Since the English Civil War, the non-conformist communities 
had always held religious liberty as the most important component of society. And it was in the city that freedom of toleration had historically been defended. In the 1640s, it was the cities which had fought for Parliament and Puritanism, and many, including Manchester and Birmingham, had suffered heavily for it. Now, in the Victorian era, cities provided a welcoming environment for the myriad of non-conformist denominations, Methodist, Baptist, Unitarian, Congregationalist, in contrast to the stifling Anglican regularity of the countryside. Non-conformist chapels frequently stood at the forefront of Victorian civic life. And the great thing about Great, great George Street uh, Congregations Chapel um, was that this is the rebuilt one. It was burnt down um, in the early 1840s, I think. Uh, they announced a, a fundraiser pretty much the next day, uh, and this was, this was up and running. After religious liberty came political liberty. Again, historically, it had always been towns which had fought for democracy and self-government against the power of the aristocracy and the crown. Urban liberty had been the historic enemy of rural aristocratic feudalism. And the battle was rejoined in the 1830s with the struggle first for the 1832 Reform Bill and then the 1835 Municipal Corporations Bill, which allowed towns to incorporate themselves, which began the process uh, towards modern local government. Indeed, as we shall see, it was the incorporation of growing towns and cities and the growth of municipal democracy which would provide part of the impetus for the construction of new town halls. Religious liberty and political liberty were both underpinned by social freedom, the city's culture of voluntary activity. For one of the intriguing ironies of Victorian urban life was that a society which was so regularly criticised for the isolationism and individualism it fostered. Think here the character of, of Joe the Crossing Sweep in Dickens's Bleak House who wanders anonymously through the pages uh, of the text and the loneliness and anime of urban living coexisted with a highly developed civil society. Clubs, societies, Athenaeums, Lyceums, literary and scientific institutes, even Gresham colleges, littered the city. They were testimony, many believed, to the progressive moral and political purposes of the city. The Liverpool architect and city booster, Sir James Picton, had no doubt about the virtue of urban life. Policy, polity, politeness, urbanity, civility, devised their names as well as their nature from city life, while the terms rustic, savage, heathen, pagan indicate the rougher and more backward tendencies of the herdsmen and cultivators of the ground. This was the great mid-Victorian spirit of mutual improvement, rational knowledge, and self-help. Indeed, it was from Samuel Smiles's time teaching at the Leeds Mechanics Institute that the journalists of self-help his, his celebrated, best-selling work was born. Behind all these advocacies of urban life was the firm conviction that with liberty came prosperity. One of the strongest arguments in favor of the industrial city was that despite the misery and poverty, it brought forth untold riches. As Alexis de Tocqueville said of Manchester, from this foul drain the greatest stream of human industry flows out to fertilize the whole world. From this filthy sewer, pure gold flows. There's a point made to another European tourist of industrialization, Friedrich Engels, having sort of listed a litany of social crimes committed by the bourgeoisie on the proletariat and the state of Manchester and the condition of the housing and the problems of sanitation. Uh, to a gentleman he, he knew, uh, a businessman. He wrote that the man listened quietly to the end and said at the corner where we parted, and yet there's a great deal of money made here. Good morning, sir. But what use were all these riches if everyone still looked down on you? The Achilles heel 
of the Victorian city, they thought, was culture. The industrial conurbations were widely ridiculed as cultural wastelands, devoid of any aesthetic values and concerned, as Engels' businessman suggested, only with the making of money. An article in the Leeds Mercury lamented how Leeds, Bradford and Liverpool had quotes in the midst of the arduous pursuits of industry, neglected almost everything except the making of individual fortunes. The Victorian civic elites were determined to counter this vulgar slur. They resented the charge that commerce and industry were somehow antithetical to culture. On the contrary, they ransacked history to show that it was cities and their wealthy patrons who had been at the forefront of artistic patronage and aesthetic sensibility. Truly great art and architecture flowed not from courtly patronage or the church or from country houses, but from merchant wealth, from industrial wealth, from commercial wealth. In the city-states of ancient Greece and Renaissance Italy, Victorian industrialists discovered a historical precedent perfect for their predicament. It was in Athens, according to one industrialist, that quotes, the study of arts and the acquirements of literature were united with and made to flourish by the pursuits of commerce. Art and commerce did not have to be in antagonism. The Renaissance world of the Florentine merchant princes, the Medici, offered an even more beguiling spectacle. Benjamin Disraeli, a politician with a personal ardor for the age of merchant princes, contended that, quotes, literature and the fine arts have ever discovered that their most munificent patrons are to be sought in the busy hum of industry. What this surge of popularity for the Renaissance and for classical history produced was a concerted attempt to play the role of merchant princes, to take up the traditional duty of wealthy urban industrialists and nurture culture, especially architecture. Across the Victorian urban landscape, the dissenting middle class refashioned the city in the texture of the Italian republics and the Greek city-states. The architecture of Venice, Florence, Siena, and Athens, as well as Antwerp, Bruges, and Ghent, was deployed to express pride in the power and shameless prosperity of an urban civilization and its merchant princes. They wanted to construct the city in their own image, and as we'll see, each before the other. So James Picton again explained the reasoning. The commercial cities of antiquity, Carthage, Tyre, Palmyra, Alexandria, erected their magnificent monuments, many of which remain to this day to attest their greatness. The cities of Middle Age commerce, Venice, Florence, and Genoa, expended their wealth in vying with each other in adorning their cities in the spirit of honorable rivalry, what we would call civic pride. So this then was the inspiration for the heroic array of town halls which would come to change the face of the Victorian city. <clears throat> and they began at the beginning in Greece. As a, as a Victorian bishop of all people, with almost pagan enthusiasm, put it, the old Greeks, when they had any citizen whom they specially delighted to honor, used to invite him to a banquet in their town hall. And to be entertained at the public expense in the town hall was the acknowledged reward of high and meritorious public services. And the city-states of classical Greece who had so successfully combined commerce and culture were a profound source of inspiration, not least in Liverpool, a port city like Athens, and also one with a history of slavery. We shouldn't forget 5,000 slave voyages departed the Liverpool docks between 1700 and 1807. The money that poured into Liverpool from the colonies 
and the riches it gained from exporting Lancashire's goods allowed Liverpool to erect an edifice suitable to its metropolitan stature. Peaked by Birmingham's building of a town hall, of which more later, the Corporation of Liverpool opened a competition to design a new status symbol for its own city. Uh, and they regarded their pre-existing town hall from the 1750s, a sort of terraced development, as far too uh, narrow uh, a building uh, for the modern Corporation of Liverpool. A 25-year-old unknown London designer, Harvey Lonsdale Elms, received the initial commission, which sadly physically killed him. Um, and the building was then completed by the more experienced C.R. Cockrell. And now, and it is, it is in particularly good shape at the moment. If you haven't been to Liverpool recently, uh, at last they've sorted out the train station. At last they've sorted out the space between the train station and St. George's Hall. And you, you leave Lime Street and you do see this absolutely stunning uh, edifice now. Pevsner rightly called it the freest neo-Grecian building in England and one of the finest in the world. Inside, the hall manages to combine an almost Roman sense uh, of space, huge insect columns, marble and gold leaf detailing, arch-coffered vault, and of course, we're looking the wrong way, uh, but the famous organ, the huge organ uh, behind it, with intricate Greek details. I will mention only in passing that they are, of course, Minton uh, tiles. The classical feel is reaffirmed by the array of sculptures of eminent Liverpudlians carved out to resemble Socrates or Caesar. Unsurprisingly, Sir James Picton celebrated the hall as a design at the head of our public buildings and worthy to take rank with those of the purest age of Grecian art. The magnificence of St George's Hall soon found its imitation on the other side of the Pennines, where plucky little Bradford, boom city of the woolen industry, responded to St George's Hall with its own St George's Hall. Initiated, designed and built over the course of barely 18 months, it was financed by the city's great and good, including Sir Titus Salt. And the very speed of its inception, the very speed of its design, construction, delivery, was itself meant to be an embodiment uh, of the energy and youthfulness uh, and dynamism uh, of Bradford. Uh, it was a great testimony uh, to the city's new industrial elite. Well, of course, Leeds was not going to stand by and allow its junior Yorkshire partner to steal the glory. A lead doctor, John Heaton, gathered the great and good of the city together to build their own monument to Leeds' commercial and civic dignity. According to his memoirs, he believed that, quote, if a noble municipal palace that might fairly vie with some of the best town halls of the continent were to be erected in the middle of their hitherto squalid and unbeautiful town, it will become a practical admonition to the populace of beauty and art. And in course of time, men would learn to live up to it. By 1853, the foundation stones were being laid, and it was soon apparent that municipal vainglory was the motive behind the project. And they have this terrible huge fight about the clock tower, about the cost of the clock tower and how you have to have a clock tower and the meaning of the clock tower. In the words of the committee chairman, the town council intend in the first place to erect a building which will improve the public taste and give an improved architectural appearance to the town of Leeds. And typically, Heaton appealed to a Renaissance precedent to make his point. For the citizens of free towns in the Middle Ages, erected for their public meetings and as the seat and outward symbol of their public government, the most sumptuous buildings. So clearly we had to have the most sumptuous building. Looming across the skyline at 92 feet tall, the town hall stands as a vast temple to the Victorian municipal spirit, an edifice according to its organizing committee, not inferior to those stately piles 
which still attest the ancient opulence of the great commercial cities of Italy and Flanders. And very self-consciously, the Victorian cities were putting themselves in a lineage which stretched back to the merchant cities of the Middle Ages. They put themselves in a continental lineage of great mercantile industrial cities that Leeds stood akin to Florence and Venice and Milan and Siena. Its style is essentially Renaissance, a huge palazzo designed in the Charles Barry mode by the brilliant young architect Cuthbert Broderick. The imposing lion statues who really took the worst of sort of industrial pollutants uh, during the 60s and 70s um, are, are images of that brazen civic self-confidence. Here was the response uh, intended for Bradford. Then came Manchester, a city with more than most to prove. For Manchester was still the shock city of the Industrial Revolution, a city that symbolized the worst excesses of Victorian industrialization. Materialism, greed, vulgarity, filth. As you enter Manchester from Rushholm, the town at the lower end of Oxford Road has the appearance of one dense volume of smoke, more forbidding than the entrance to Dante's Inferno. It was a fairly typical response to the phenomenon of Manchester by the cooperative pioneer George Jacob Holyoke. It struck me that were it not for the previous knowledge, no man would have the courage to enter it. Um, and, and he, he has this other later about rather, rather, he'd rather, I can't remember, it's a terrible quote about dying a death somewhere rather than being hanged in Manchester. Um, <laughs> clearly improvements were needed. And in the latter half of the 19th century, the merchants and civic leaders of Manchester poured huge sums into creating uh, the, the Manchester of the mid-Victorian years, that remarkable testament to commerce, industry, and civic pride. The great uh, free trade uh, hall uh, dedicated, as AJP Taylor said, to a proposition. And there are a few buildings dedicated to a proposition. The last and greatest of the Hanseatic towns, Taylor called Manchester, a civilization created by traders without assistance from monarchs or territorial aristocracy. And obviously any town hall would have to reflect such remarkable urban ambition. As Alfred Waterhouse's epic medieval palace did so in full. Rising up from the cobbled Albert Square, the town hall mixes Christian Gothic with a more Ruskinian Venetian Gothic to produce that remarkable air of authority and grandeur. As one enters through the carved wooden doors, you sort of, you're instantly narrowed uh, uh, in quite a tight, encapsulated uh, uh, space. Um, it feels almost like uh, St. Mark's, but instead of sort of Byzantine iconography, you're in between the statues of John Dalton and his pupil James Jewell, immediately announcing uh, the city's pride in their scientific, uh, rational uh, past. The ground floor then has this calm, cloistered feel, Gothic arches interplay with statues uh, of such civic icons as Oliver Cromwell, a great hero for the Manchester nonconformists, uh, and Richard Cobden, the man who encouraged Manchester to incorporate itself, to gain uh, local self-government. The hall's iconography is loyal to the precepts of the Manchester School, with the city's mercantile heritage not hidden or deprecated, but rudely celebrated. And as you walk along the tessellated floor, you instantly see this, this triumphant celebration of what made money in the city. They are not hiding. Uh, the, the cotton plant. Uh, they are not hiding their industriousness uh, uh, codified uh, by the bee. These are people proud of work, proud of making money, uh, proud of uh, industry uh, and business. This unashamed approach to Manchester's commercial identity culminates um, in the Great Hall, um, a sort of typical, uh, uh, as it were, sort of uh, faux Gothic Great Hall, but then around the edges, which you can't really see, are these extraordinary frescoes 
uh, by Ford Maddox Brown, celebrating Manchester's past. And what do they point to? They point to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. They point to Bradshaw's defence of Manchester in 1642, i.e. a defence of religious liberty and political autonomy. Uh, they point to Manchester's internationalism. Uh, this is a heroic celebration of the meaning of Manchester um, at the heart um, uh, of this building. For John Bright, the Member of Parliament and great apostle of Manchester liberalism, the building was testimony to the forces of liberality, forces of generosity, and of freedom, municipal freedom. As to the town hall itself, it is truly a municipal palace. There is nothing like it so far as I know. This is what abroad they call the Hôtel de Ville, or what London people call the Mansion House, or what you call your town hall. But I doubt whether there is a building equal in costliness very happy with the amount of money they spent on this, uh, and grandeur to this. But this was not a view altogether shared in Birmingham. For there, a rather different conception of civic pride, beyond the mercantile inspirations of Athens and Florence, had developed. As the British electoral system began to change, and the urban working class was slowly enfranchised, a new understanding of urban life emerged. It started with the teachings of two nonconformist ministers, George Dawson and R. W. Dale. They argued that a city should be understood as more than just a random collection of individuals dedicated to commerce and sociability. Instead, a city was an organic community with a heart and a soul, that a city could be understood uh, as a corpus, as a totality. And the body which should represent the town, which should voice its lofty nature, should not be these merchants and industrialists endowing these beautiful buildings, but rather the elected city council. Dawson and Dale preached a municipal gospel, or a civic gospel, which celebrated the potential of councils to transform the lives of their urban constituents. And one man who heard their cry was a young industrialist, recently moved to Birmingham, called Joseph Chamberlain. He put himself forward for the council, outlining a radical new philosophy of municipal activism. In contrast to the Westminster Parliament, concerned with matters of empire and war, Chamberlain celebrated the immediacy of local government to the people and strove to, rep strove to elevate the reputation of councillors, both by his own service as a councillor and encouraging his peers. Um, and that took some work in Birmingham where you know, the, the reputation of the councillors was not strong. It was not helped by their tendency to meet above the tripe shop. Uh, they, they did not believe in the value uh, of, of, uh, of council authorities. But Chamberlain began to change that. There is no nobler sphere for those who have not the opportunity of engaging in imperial politics than to take part in municipal work, he said. And so with Chamberlain into office in Birmingham in the 1870s came a cadre of leading businessmen and professionals inspired by the preaching of the municipal gospel and excited by the opportunity of power. And this was reflected not in Birmingham's town hall, uh, which was... Uh, an 1830s uh, um, uh, building um, modelled uh, on the Roman temple of Castor uh, and Pollux, and again in absolutely uh, superb uh, shape now, uh, designed by Joseph Hanson uh, of the Hanson Cab. Uh, that was the old vision of mercantile commercial, uh, the Victorian city. Instead, what Chamberlain pointed to was the council house, here with the new edition of the floozy in the jacuzzi, uh, as she's known, uh, in front. <laughs> 150 feet long, 160 feet tall, complete with grand dome and portico relief depicting Britannia rewarding the Birmingham manufacturers, the Birmingham Council House, and that's its name, stands as a 19th century Venetian palace with Victoria Square acting as its St. Mark's. It is a bricks and mortar memorial to the municipal gospel. 
and Chamberlain brilliantly and eloquently expressed as much on its opening. He said, just as in past times we have provided for our monarchs and our princes palaces in which to live, just as now we provide magnificent edifices for our great state departments and have found a worthy home for the imperial legislature itself, Westminster, so I now think it behoves us to find a fitting habitation for our local parliament, to show the value we put upon our privileges and our free institutions. Let me remind you that those old communities from whom we derive the model of our municipal institutions were never behind hand in the discharge of this duty. We find in the old cities of the continent, of Belgium and Germany and Italy, the free and independent burghers of the Middle Ages have left behind them magnificent palaces and civic buildings, testimonies to their power and public spirit and munificence, memorials of the time when those communities maintained the liberties and protected the lives of the people against the oppression and the tyranny and the rapacity of their rulers. This was a celebration of Victorian local government or what the Victorians called local self-government, uh, the right uh, and uh, um, autonomy of cities and authorities to look after themselves against the rapacity, as it were, of their rulers. So what of London? There was a growing sense in the latter half of the 19th century that the capital was falling behind both in relation to other European capitals, particularly France, after what Baron Haussmann had achieved in Paris in the 1850s, and in contrast to the great northern cities. London's persistent failure to develop any kind of municipal patriotism was the product of a failure of political representation, and obviously one doesn't want to bite the hand that feeds one, but an overpowerful city corporation. Corporation of London. The great London County Council firebrand John Burns described how the corporation, quote, could have been the heir of all the civic ages, the nexus of all the traditions and historical associations of the civitas of a free people. But instead, it had become hypnotized by vested interests, nepotism, and feasting. Most notably, turtle soup. It was now the duty as Burns saw it, of the London County Council, the new democratically elected London County Council, to bring to life a revivified municipal ideal, as he put it. And the LCC did so partly through a program of relentless public works. Indeed, the LCC Public Works Department was the largest direct employer in Europe for a while. They spent voraciously on the parks and open spaces which now fell under their control from Finsbury Park to Southwark Park, from Wandsworth to Hackney Common, as a symbol of an attempt to revive a new municipal spirit. But not everyone was delighted with such assertiveness. Um, the LCC and its urban ambitions um, gained a number um, of opponents, and the response was the formation of the Metropolitan Borough Councils, in 1899, established deliberately to neuter the radicalism of the LCC, taking on the power of the old vestries and boards of London. Not only were they the sanitary, paving and street lighting authorities, but they took on responsibility for baths, wash houses, burial grounds and public libraries. Most significant of all was the symbolism of the borough status and its improved position in the world of local self-government, with its own mayors, aldermen, and all the trimmings. And what this produced was a new sense of pride in the boroughs and suburbs of London, which for years had to put up uh, with the criticism of Walter Besant and others uh, of their philistinism and backwardness and cultural desertedness and all the rest of it. And now through the Metropolitan Borough Councils, they have this assertion of their identity uh, and, their, and their purpose. And this was consciously reflected in urban space and design. Listen, for instance, to the mayor of West Ham in 1936, extolling the virtues of his borough's progress. In my early days, 
There were no municipal recreation grounds or playing fields, no municipal college, secondary, central, special, open air or nursery schools, not yet free schools, no municipal libraries, baths, tramways or electricity undertakings, no municipal hospitals, maternity and child welfare clinics or school medical clinics. Truly, there has been a wonderful growth of educational and public health services, those twin handmaidens which have brought to our citizens healthier, happier and longer lives. And what this produced in de design terms were great public buildings, working tramways, well-tended parks, decent underground stations, museums, libraries, bathhouses, and wonderful town halls. The ambition was that there was not to be one London, but 30 Birminghams. And in the run-up to World War I, as many as 13 new town halls were constructed around the capital. Think here, uh, Ealing Town Hall, Tottenham Town Hall, perhaps most famously of all, East Ham uh, Town Hall. West Ham Town Hall's not bad either. Or Camberwell, with its magnificent art gallery, or Battersea, with its pioneering Latchmere estate, or Croydon, with, quotes, one of the finest piles of municipal buildings in the country. This was the architecture of what the Soviet modernist Berthold Lubetkin, designer of the great Finsbury Health Centre, would come to call the architecture of civic valour. And down the decades, that notion of civic valour has been best expressed in our architecture and design of town halls. They are arguably the canaries in the mine. They reveal the pride and ambition, the power and authority of local government and democracy at any time in history. They reflect where wealth and dynamism lay. And those who designed and built them built, like Ruskin urged, to the glory of a greater calling, be it local, civic, or even national. In the 1400s, it was London's Guildhall. In the 1800s, the great town halls of the industrial cities. That was why Sir Charles Barry could be commissioned for both the Palace of Westminster and Halifax Town Hall. And what do we have now? <coughs> we have City Hall. And that certainly tells us something. Perhaps we're feeling charitable, transparency, accountability, self-government, but also shoddy design, confused public-private partnership, and a building which looks like it is a wholly owned subsidiary of Canary Wharf. But perhaps I should leave the broader story of how we got from the Guildhall to the Silt Hall to the City Hall for another time. Thank you. <laughs>